Mark chapter number 9. The Gospel of Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter number 9 and verse number 7. <clears throat> the scripture says, There was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son. Hear him. Father, bless this book now. Let your word go forth for the purpose you intended. Our Father, use this messenger tonight, Lord, for your glory. In thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. The Lord speaks from heaven. And he says, I want you to listen to my son, okay? Listen to my son. In Matthew chapter number 7, verse 28, it says, And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now, I don't know if you've spent any time in the Talmud. I've spent a little bit. But you'll find the Talmud is a place of, uh, of a debate, uh, a lot of debate down through the years, down through the, down through the centuries, essentially. The Talmud is a product of oral tradition. The basis of or the, the document today that uh, came into existence because of oral tradition is called the Mishnah. The Mishnah is the basis of the Talmud. You have the Gemara and you have uh, the uh, Midrash and you have other parts that make up the Talmud. But the Mishnah is, is the basis and the Mishnah is based on oral tradition, okay? Not the written word of God. There's a big difference. As you know, I've mentioned it to you time and time again, that the Pharisees taught that the word of God was given to Moses at Mount Sinai, the written word, but also the oral tradition was given at Sinai. And the oral tradition given only to the Jews allowed them to be separate and hidden from Gentile understanding and domain. And so, therefore, they, they have embraced oral tradition more than the written word of God. The Samaritans and the Kairite Jews and others reject the oral tradition, rightfully so, and so do I. The Lord said 2,000 years ago, you've made the word of God of none effect by your traditions. And that is a direct reference to that. If you notice, he spoke to us and he never quoted oral tradition one time. Any scripture that the Lord Jesus Christ ever quoted was written scripture. Moses, he quoted the Pentateuch. He quoted the prophets. He quoted the Psalms, which make up the three basic divisions of the Bible, the Navim, the Ketuvim, and the Torah. This makes up the three basic divisions of the Old Testament. The Navim's the prophet. Ketuvim's the writing. The Torah is the law, and it makes up their Bible. The Jews have far more respect, for the most part, many of them do, for their scriptures than the Gentiles do for their scriptures. That's such a shame, don't you think? We should respect our scriptures because it's the word of God. So it's important to understand where God spoke to them. And when Jesus, our Lord, spoke, he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. In other words, he wasn't speaking as one who, who spoke, uh, who spoke uh, very carefully from the oral tradition, he spoke from scripture, thus saith the Lord. So his voice must be trusted. The Lord points to the fact that it should. In Hebrews chapter one, it says this, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, prophetes, okay, the Navim in the Old Testament by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, see that? whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Did the Lord Jesus Christ say, you have heard it said, you have heard it said, but I say unto thee. How many of you remember him saying that? You have heard it said, but I say unto thee. You have heard it said, but I say unto thee. Now that's quite an arrogant statement from someone if he's not the son of God. But since he wrote the Bible, he has every reason in the world to quote it as he pleases, right? Of course he does. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the bread of life. This bread of life we find in John chapter number 6 is a, uh, it finds its type in the showbread, the showbread back in the tabernacle. So what is the showbread? Well, the bread represents life-sustaining element of Christ. There's a lot of different things that relate to him personally, 
But when it comes to bread, it has to do with your life sustaining. How do you live? What keeps you alive? What keeps you going? If you're trusting in religion to keep you going, you're headed for a downfall. If you're trusting people to keep you going, you're going to fail. If you trust yourself to keep you going, you're not going to make it. The only one that can keep you going is Christ. And he's the bread of life. He is what is necessary. I want you to notice something. John chapter number 12 and verse 24, the Lord said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He is that corn of wheat. Our Lord Jesus Christ is that corn of wheat. In other words, he's that seed. John chapter number 12, verse 27, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Well, the corn of wheat that goes into the ground is ground in the mill of suffering. This bread of life that we take of him, ground in the mill of suffering. It was through suffering, only through suffering, that Christ could be perfected, as the scripture says. John chapter number 12 and verse 30, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world, and now shall the prince of this world be cast out. <coughs> and if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Well, what we have here is he's a corn of wheat, goes into the ground. Then he's ground in the mill of suffering, and now he's brought into the fire of judgment. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, here I am. I'm the bread of life. We feed off of his life. This is what we feed off of. I encourage you tonight, get your eyes off of people and put them on the Lord. People will fail you, even the best of people. They may mean well. They may even be trying to help you. And in trying to help you, they may fail you. So you've got to be awful careful when it comes to people. But we feed off of his life. He's the author of eternal salvation. He's the one who designed our faith. Look what it says in Hebrews chapter number 10, 2 and verse number 10. Hebrews 2.10 says this, For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, see him, of and by, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Christ was not imperfect in anything, but he was perfected in the sense that everything that could be learned through suffering, he learned it. Everything that could be gained for God to become flesh, he gained. Everything that could be known when God made himself a man, he knew. You see what I'm saying? He perfected it. There's no more to be known. There's no more to be learned. There's no more suffering to be done. He's finished with all of that. The word translated captain here is archegos. That's a strong Greek word. That word means an originator, a founder, a leader, a chief, the first in place, a prince. The Lord Jesus Christ is called the archegos of life in Acts chapter number 3 and verse 15. Listen to this. And you killed the prince of life. That word prince is archegos. Remember, translated captain in one place, prince in the other. Are you getting a hold of how the Bible goes now? Same word, but the context is different. So it's translated differently. And the Bible says, And the kill, you kill the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses, because he is the beginning or the originator of God's creation. He is the source of a life that did not exist before Christ was, before God was manifest in the flesh and lived a sinless, perfect life. And on the third day, he arose from the dead with resurrection life. God had never been raised from the dead before because God had never died. But when he arose on that third day, he gives us that life and that becomes our life that is our eternal life. He designed that life. You see, an archegos, think of him as, a, as an architect. Think about that, an architect. One who has a predetermined shape in mind. One who has a goal in mind. One who intends to do something and nobody's going to stop it whatsoever. So if he's called the captain of our salvation, he's made perfect through sufferings, then we need to think about that. 
He's the captain of our salvation. He's the originator of our salvation. He's the designer of our salvation. Did the Lord Jesus live 2,000 years ago on this earth? Did he breathe the same air you breathe? Did he eat the same food you eat? Did he suffer the same sufferings you suffered? Did he get tired like we get tired? Did they turn on him like they turn on us? Did he face the problems of life like, like we do? Well, what he is doing is showing you how that he is the reason we live because Christ liveth in us the life which I now live in the faith. I live by the, fle by the faith of the life I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Here's how it says it in Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus. See that? Set your mind on him. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Everything he attempted to do, he finished. And he finished it in perfection. You see what I mean? He was perfected. He finished it in perfection. Nothing could have been done better than he did. No one could come along behind him and add to what he did. He perfected it. And salvation has been perfected. Now salvation, folks, is a multifaceted thing. He's saving you right now. Do you realize that? He's saving you right now. You mean to tell me that my salvation wasn't? Oh, absolutely. But what's being saved? You see, the Bible says we're saved by his life. Well, his life at the right hand of the Father as the intercessor pleading your case is saving your physical life on this earth. Not your soul. Your soul was saved at the moment you were born of the Spirit of God. See what I mean? So you see then how that salvation can reach way past one event and begins. you can take it and apply it to many types of events. And this is why he's the author of eternal salvation. Think about that. He said, I give unto them eternal life, John chapter, where was that, 10, I think? And no man shall pluck them from my Father's hand, nor can they pluck them from my hand. Well, folks that believe you can lose your salvation, don't spend time, they don't like to spend much time in John. <laughs> you know why? Because John was the last gospel written, written long after the kingdom was rejected. There's no more kingdom of heaven. There's no more turning the cheek. Now he says, go out and buy a sword. And the gospel of John is written, to, that Jews and Gentiles both, because look at the context of it. It's written for Gentiles that don't know a thing about the Jewish faith. And in the Gospel of John, there is no stronger book in the whole Bible as it applies to eternal salvation. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Do you believe that tonight? Well, here's what, here's what the Bible's saying. The Bible is saying the reason I can give you eternal life is first of all because I bought it, and paid for it with my own blood on the cross at Calvary, but because I designed the life that you are going to live, and there's nothing you're going to be able to do in that life that you live that's going to cause you to lose salvation because I already knew ahead of time what your life would be and what a human life would going to be, is going to be on this earth, and I perfected it when I lived a sinless, perfect life. That's quite a thought because th that way he becomes the author of eternal salvation. I like it when the Bible uses terms like that for the Lord. He's called the apostle, the Lord Jesus Christ, the apostle of our faith. Remember? The sent one, the author of eternal salvation. Remember when I was a kid, we had a, a, we had a card game back then called Arthur's. And it was, it was about little women. It was about, uh, it was, it, you know, who wrote Little Women? Who? Exactly. And I learned that when I was seven years old. I knew every author of every book that we had in that deck. Now I can't remember more than maybe five or six or seven of them. But I remembered them. I remember them. And uh, it was very interesting to me because an author is someone who comes up from nowhere, nowhere with something that did not exist before and writes it out. And it's quite a thing. Yes, it is. An author. And he's the author of eternal salvation. So what's that mean? Well, here's what Peter says about it. Now, here's what Peter says about this salvation. The Bible said in 1 Peter 1, Whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, 
of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. See that? These prophets, they were men of God, and they were men of God for their time. And they looked into the future and saw things that they didn't understand, but because they were obedient unto God, they prophesied them. You know, a prophet doesn't have to understand what he's prophesying to prophesy the truth. The truth of the matter is the prophet's not the source of the prophecy. Who's the source of it? It's the Almighty. He's the only one who can see the end and the beginning. He's the only one who knows the future. So, absolutely, he's the author of eternal salvation and to all them that believe, looking unto Jesus, the author. Now, don't you notice where this shows up? This is the 12th chapter of Hebrews. What's over in chapter number 11? Right? The 11th chapter of Hebrews, all the, the uh, heroes of faith, right? You start out with Adam and you go all the way through the heroes of faith. It gets all the way down to the point in the last part of the 11th chapter of, of Hebrews where they're not even named. Many of them there, though, that were people in the Old Testament who believed God and they believed the light they had and they trusted in the Lord and they walked in faith. You remember Sunday morning's message when I preached to you about how? Old Testament salvation and we talked about New Testament salvation. You remember when the Apostle Paul went to the, to the Athenians there, to the Agora in Athens, Greece, and he stood before an image to the unknown God. You remember that? They were very superstitious. They didn't want to leave any of the gods out. All right. He said, well, he said there was a time. Now, here's what he said to them, folks. I think this is Acts 17, somewhere in there. He said there was a time of this ignorance that God winked at. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. He said, let me tell you who this God is. And then he told them. Some of them believed him. Others said, who is this babbler? We'll wait for a more convenient time and we may listen again. Sounds like that Roman procurator, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. We'll wait and we'll see what he says. You see, there are people who all they like to do is debate. That's what they were there for, to hear some new thing. Remember? Do you remember that Greece, where do you think, where did democracy come from? How many know that today? I just about told you. <laughs> it came from Greece. It came from Greece. All right, democracy. What's democracy? It's the voice of the people, right? If a person has a voice, they have a, they have a voice, right? That's what democracy is supposed to be. You take that and you compare that to, to North Korea, that's no democracy, is it? Russia's not a democracy. Saudi Arabia, they've got a man sentenced to death because he posted something on YouTube. All right? Freedom of speech is the first thing that dies in an uh, in a, in a autocratic situation or dictator or so forth. Democracy in its essence is a good thing. But the problem is it can also devolve into a bad thing. So what do you mean? Democracy can devolve into the rule of the mob because when common sense is outruled by numbers. So what do you mean then, preacher? Democracy has that weakness. So how do you control that? With a republic. That's how you do it. You create a constitution and you establish the laws of that constitution and that constitution then governs the democracy. And you even, if you're real smart, what you do is take every state and give it uh, what's called an electoral college. It has what, what do they call that? I may fall along with me now. What, what do they call that? The electoral vote, they pick, elector, they, they pick electors in each state and each state has so many. In other words, the state may not have over 500,000 people in it. Arizona, or one of those, Nevada, Arizona, Nevada, somewhere up in there. I forget, Wyoming, it may be Wyoming, I think it's Wyoming. The whole state doesn't have 500,000 people. Well, there's more people than that in Manhattan. Think about it. And yet, they cannot take away the number of electors they have in that state, not how many they have, which means that in order to win the presidency of this country, you have to win the electoral college. So the founders of this nation, really pretty smart men. They wanted a democracy, but they wanted to control it. That's a good idea. Amen. How'd we get there? How'd I get off on that? <laughs> I marvel at how, how things develop. 
<laughs> yes, did, were they living under democracy 2,000 years ago? No, no, sir. 2,000 years ago, they were living under Roman oppression, the iron fist of Rome, who put up puppet kings and puppet governments, you know, to give an appearance that they were being governed by their own. But they all knew that the Roman emperor was the one who was ruling over them. So what we have here is looking to Jesus. He stands as the chief witness. Watch his life. Study him. You know, Joshua's a type of Christ. He really is. But he doesn't show up until Moses is gone. I want you to notice. The Bible says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Right? Yes, it did. Yes, it did. You say, well, was not the law the truth? Absolutely. But it could not be applied like grace can apply it. Think about that. It was the truth. But only grace has that ability to apply something beyond the confines and demands of the law. And this is why you are saved by grace. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Hallelujah to God for that. I'd hate to think that God's going to judge me whether I keep the law or not to get into heaven. If that's the case, I'm done right now. I'm finished. I'm done for Romans 8, 37 says, Nay, and all these things were more than conquerors through him that loved us. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. In any man's sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So the Lord Jesus Christ is called an apostle. He's called a captain. And now he's called an advocate for, with the Father. And this, of course, is his ministry today. Now, here's what happens when he went back to heaven. He gave us gifts. The scripture says here in the Bible, listen carefully to this. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, Ephesians 1.11. Then in verse 14, Ephesians 1, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So we're here temporarily Bottom line is that uh, the truth is, if he didn't have a purpose, the moment you were saved, you'd disappear. You'd be gone. You'd be gone on to be with the Lord. And here's what Peter said in 1 Peter 4.10. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Let's talk about that gift for just a moment. The Bible says the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. That's exactly right. God had a purpose to give you a gift. I believe every soul in the body of Christ has a gift from God. Some more than one, but every one has one. Every last one of us, a gift from God. What's a gift? A gift is a supernatural entity given to you from an almighty eternal being. And that gift is not based on talent or ability, that gift is a supernatural thing given from God and anointed by the Holy Ghost. So therefore it is supernatural in origin and its power comes from the Holy Spirit of God. That's the gifts that we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. When you get home and read it and study that a little bit and you'll find a lot of gifts included there. But here's what the Bible says about it. As every man hath received the gift, so minister. Ephesians 4 verse 7, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Then in 1 Corinthians 7, 7, for I would that all men were even as myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. Did you see that? Let me read it again for you now so you know it's not Preacher Lawson saying everyone has a gift. 1 Corinthians 7, 7, for I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. So what's it given for? Read 1 Corinthians 12. It's given to profit with all. It's given to be a blessing to the one, to the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, not to the person. Nowhere in the Bible is a gift given to you so you can go around and brag about it. The gift is given so that the body of Christ can be ministered to. One pastor 
One bishop cannot minister to all the needs of a congregation. This is why you have deacons. This is why you have elders. This is why you have pastors. And this is why you have a bishop. Each one of these are given to the church for a specific purpose and reason. They all have gifts. And the gifts originate from God by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. You ought to pray tonight when you get home and ask the Lord, what, Lord, what's my gift? What is my gift? Let me give you a good illustration. I heard this on the radio a few weeks ago and it made such an impression on me. I wrote it down. There was some young man in the church. He was, I don't know where it was, but he loved young people. He loved them. He loved young people. So he started inviting them over to his home. They'd go over to his home, open the Bible, read the Bible, talk, sing, just get together. As they say today, hang out. <laughs> That's what they say. When they, you know, it grew, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew. And apparently, obviously, he was ministering something to these young people that resonated with them. It spoke to them. It touched them. And, and it began to grow and grow and grow and grow. Well, it wasn't, before, it wasn't too long before the hierarchy, you know, in the church began to notice this. And they said to themselves, well, now this is all well and good, but this man that's doing this, he's not qualified. He hasn't been to school. So they went and got him a man who'd been to one of their schools, and they put him over it. Put him right into a ministry that was bustling, that God was blessing, and God was using. And guess what happened? It dried up and died. Let me tell you why. There's nothing wrong with going to school. Lord knows we need all the training we can get. Study to show thyself approved to God. Believe me. When God called me here, he called me to school. And I've been in school for 47 years. <laughs> nothing wrong with school. But listen. That man that had those kids into his home, the young people, I think they were up 20s, you know, up, up in age, 20, so. They loved him and their ministry and he was ministering to them. He had received a gift from God, a burden on his soul. And the Holy Spirit was speaking through him and they knew it. And he was reaching down into their heart and into their soul. And it was, and it was doing something for them and they were growing. Okay? That's what the Bible's talking about. That's a gift from God. Okay? That's a gift. But just because some young man's been off to a Bible college, good, go to Bible colleges, that's fine. Go study the word, that's all well. But that does not qualify you and that does not say you have the gift to minister like that young man was ministering. How many agree with that tonight? Well, build Temple Baptist Church on that. Stick with that tonight. Amen? Stick with it. I came here, I've been saved three years. I've been saved three years. And the only study I'd been able to get was what I'd got my hands on, whatever I could scratch up and get and this and that and this and that and this and that. But I, I studied and I studied and I studied and I studied. You say, what do you do that for, preacher? Because if you're going to be a pastor and a bishop of a church, you better study. And if you're not willing to study, step out of the pulpit. Go somewhere and, and you, God can use you. He can use you. But you have no business trying to pastor a church. Because the first thing that a pastor does, he's apt to teach. Apt to teach. He's got to be, like I'm doing for you tonight, he's got to be able to teach the word. And as the years passed and I learned more, I could learn more. I could teach more. I could do more. And thank God for it. Everything I know tonight, I'd know more if I wasn't so stubborn. And I'd, I'd know more, I'd probably know more if I wasn't so blame lazy. How many of you are lazy in here tonight? Boy, I am. Sometimes I'll crack the books, buddy, and bury my nose in there. Hallelujah, and study up a storm. And then sometimes, just him haul around. Just. <laughs> it's amazing. And we're all guilty of that at times, a certain degree. Now, there's nothing wrong with resting and relaxing. The mind does need to be, does need a time. But here's what I'm doing tonight. I'm trying to say to you, we need to minister, okay? There's a lot of people out there that need ministering too. They need to be helped. They're reaching out, they're calling, they send cards, they write letters, they visit, and uh, they're on. It's amazing, folks. You'd be surprised at how many, right here in Knoxville, Tennessee, that are hungry. They're looking for something, and they're coming through here. And so uh, pray over that. Pray about that. And see if, uh, if, uh, if, if, if God would have you do something like that. We've got a lady that's been a member of our church here for a long time. She's essentially shut in, and she needs a visit. A lady. So it would be nice if a couple of ladies visited with her. 
and just paid her a nice Christian visit and prayed with her and let her know you love her and, and, it, and, you, and that she, and she means something. She matters to this church. And uh, something like that will be a good thing. And it's a good testimony to the church. But I'm going to tell you what something like that will do for you. It will draw you closer to the Lord. And you'll feel more of the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. You, you really will. You'll see a difference in the way things, uh, in the way things happen. Uh, it's, you know, some churches are, are real bad. Well, we pay the pastor to do all of that. Yeah, but the pastor, he can't, he can't do it all. There's no way in the world he can do it all. I can't teach all those classes up there. We've got wonderful Sunday school teachers here. Tonight started our new classes. All right, they're up there tonight, Wednesday night. Wonderful teachers up here working with these kids. That's a wonderful thing. You think, can I go up there and do all of that? Well, of course not. There's no way in the world. So what do I do? I thank God that we have people that are dedicated to do something like that and serve the Lord. I appreciate that, don't you? Yes, sir. And I want to tell you something. Don't ever diminish the importance of teaching. Don't ever diminish it. Teaching is very important. It's fundamental. Teaching, teaching is as important to your faith as a Christian as it is to when you first got the alphabet together, started forming words, and with words you started forming sentences with concepts and ideas and thoughts and created paragraphs which would, which would bring together a number, of, uh, thought, a number of ideas that would support the thought of that paragraph and get into literature and you started reading and reading opened up a whole new world for you and you realize that this is a much bigger world than what I've ever known. And books, a library will open up for you a world that's, that's beyond your wildest imagination. But it's, reading is fundamental. It's fundamental. If you can't read, if you're illiterate, and there are people who are, and for some, some have problems. There are some people, I've, I've, I read a thing a few years ago about a 50-year-old man. And he, had to, he couldn't read all, all of his life. He tried and tried and tried and tried and tried. But then finally someone helped him and showed him a way that he could learn to read. And it worked. So, you know, I don't know what the individual situation might be, but I think it's a wonderful thing when somebody can read, don't you? Don't ever forget the bumper sticker that says, if you can read this, thank a teacher. <laughs> right. That's fundamental, though. That's the basis. So you need to get the first fruits. You need to get the milk. You need to start with what God's word says. Build upon the doctrines, the blood atonement, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the second coming of the Lord, the coming millennium, tribulation period, the relationship we have one with another, the security you have as a believer. These are things to build your faith upon. And once you build it upon that, you'll get stronger and stronger and stronger and teach your children that. So if, if you're struggling to read tonight, uh, Ask God to help you with it. Ask God. Ask him, ask him to give you the, what you need to learn to do that. For readings, some people, reading is just nothing. It comes just like that. Other people, they struggle with it. That doesn't mean one's better than the other. That simply means we're made differently. Amen. When you get past 2 plus 2, I'm hurting when it gets in math. Amen. <laughs> well, I'm not quite that bad, but I'll tell you right now, if I had to make my living as a mathematician, I'd be a hunger. I'd be starved to death tonight. Couldn't make it. God didn't make me that way. So how are you made? All right. What are your gifts? Let's ask God to show us and then use them for the glory of God. Amen. And above all things, have charity. Relationship that you have one with another. You bear one another's burdens, love each other. Don't mock each other because you may be much better at math than someone or you may be much better at literature than someone. You can get a concept, a thought. You can see where the author was headed and you can get all that and you get it quickly. Others don't get it that quickly. But stay with each other and pray with each other and support each other and love each other and that will give the Holy Spirit a free place to move in your midst. And when the Holy Ghost starts moving, power moves in your midst folks amen power don't quince him don't grieve him father bless your word now in thy holy name thank you lord for the folks who listened i pray i had some little something to say tonight to be beneficial and helpful in thy name i pray amen all right